Okay, good afternoon. So today is Friday, a holiday, but we are here to listen to Frank Patrasson. Uh, Frank is here under the um, Cap Sprint program at the University of Brasilia and at the program of geology at the doctorate and master program of geology at the Geoscience Institute. And this is the second, um, say, second speech by, by Frank. He gave us a lecture last Wednesday, and today he's going to talk to us about iron isotope cycling. What can you learn about the functioning of the Amazon basin? I know this is a topic that Frank is working for quite a long time. This is also a topic that we uh, we addressed during the Clima Amazon uh, project we had here in Brasilia. It was very important to not only to know Frank, but to know many other people that work with us. And today, Frank will talk talk to us about what what we have advanced in this topic in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years or so. So, Frank, thank you very much for coming on the holiday. And I'd like to tell you all that we have an audience. Actually, you cannot say the audience. May, may I show you the audience? This is very important because people here on a Friday, so they're, they're really anxious to listen to Frank. Okay, let's listen to Frank. Thank you very much again, Roberto, for this uh, int introduction. And uh, thank you very much all for coming this uh, on this holiday. For me, this is easy because this is not a holiday in France, but I know that this is one for you. So I hope that uh, we will still remain friends after that. <laughs> we'll see. So as uh, Roberto mentioned, uh, the idea of this presentation is to uh, see what we can learn about the functioning of the Amazon basin on the basis of the study of the iron cycling and more particularly using iron isotopes. So as you mentioned, this is something uh, we started about a decade ago uh, on the basis of various funding. You mentioned the European funding, but they were funding from Brazil, they were funding from France as well. And uh, this particularly involved three PhD theses um, that were in co-tutela between uh, Brazil and France. So I'm talking about the, the PhD of uh, Gianna uh, Dos Santos Pinheiro, Mars, uh, uh, Daniel Mulholland, and Alison Ackerman, who did a lot of work. And uh, many of, of the results that I will present uh, are also there. And uh, the idea of this presentation is so to show you what we've did, but also to see where we could go further in today's direction. So initially, the idea was to do a kind of interactive presentation in which um, I would ask you for direction, and because you, you know uh, you know um, much uh, about uh, this topic. The thing is that for some of the audience that is following remotely this presentation, it might not be that easy. So maybe we will try to do this kind of discussion towards the end of this presentation. But if you have ideas or comments, do not hesitate to, to interrupt me and maybe through the chat uh, if, uh, if you want to, to add something. So what about the context first? Well, this is the Amazon Basin, so I won't uh, teach to Brazilian what is the Amazon Basin, of course. <laughs> you know much better than I do. You know how big it is, how important it is for the world over, because this is the biggest um, basin uh, of the world. So if you are concerned about uh, freshwater transfer by rivers or by uh, suspended matter transfer to the oceans, uh, it represents about 18%. 17%, 18%, so this is really a lot. Uh, nothing else matches it uh, elsewhere in the world, so this is a very interesting uh, topic, uh, subject for research. Another important aspect of the Amazon basin is that it is more or less well superposed with the uh, Amazon biome, that is the Amazon forest mostly. And this uh, biome is very important because uh, First, it uh, hosts one of the largest biodiversity in the world, particularly uh, near the Andes, here. But uh, for, for a long time, he, it was uh, offering uh, a service to mankind that was very important because it was a sink of CO2 um, that we produce in the atmosphere. But unfortunately, by the turn of the century, things have changed. 
since in 2005 and 2010 we had dramatic growth and during these two years uh, people specialists of the carbon cycle said that in fact it was a sink so this is an issue but i don't know if you had a look at the last jike report that was uh, published uh, last month but uh, some uh, people say that um, by the middle of this century uh, the amazon basin may turn as a uh, source for CO2 and by maybe the end of the century it may become a savanna. So nothing at all about uh, this uh, uh, wet rainforest that we have today. So this is really a, a key issue. Fortunately, if you look at the JAIC report, uh, this is still something that is much debated. So I hope that those people saying that are wrong. But to know that, that we need to study it and this is what I'm proposing here through a different approach. Another issue uh, that uh, concern the, the Amazon forest is the deforestation. Uh, by 2015, about 17% of, uh, of the forest was, uh, has, had gone, been transformed um, in, past, in uh, pasture uh, for cattle, as well as for mining activities. So this may look a lot, particularly if you look at this rain zone in the Amazon basin. But if you think about other tropical forests elsewhere in the world, for example, if you think about the Indo Indonesian forest that uh, was, has been already destroyed by um, nearly 80%, this is still a very well preserved uh, tropical forest. And, in, and therefore, this is a very good reason why, if you want to study natural process in, the, in a tropical uh, basin, then uh, the Amazon uh, forest is a very good example. Since I was talking about the carbon, uh, issues at stake linked to the carbon cycle in tropical forests that I found in the 2019 JAIC report on climate change and lands. Um, uh, notably, they found, they noticed, so this is a, a report, but uh, not the one I was mentioning, but that, uh, another one that was, uh, uh, that was published two, two years uh, before. They found that, uh, because this is a review of the literature, they found that some author think that the carbon flux from tropical rivers to the ocean uh, may have been estimated by 70%, which is a lot. We are not talking about uh, very small variations. And if that was the case, then it means that uh, uh, these carbon flux would represent about 10% of the uh, entropic greenhouse gas emissions. So when we are studying trans carbon transfer from the Amazon basin, uh, this really represents something significant. Another issue is that highly variable at as atmospheric carbon flux from tropical forests have been found, depending on the authors. And the reason for this is that um, it's difficult to estimate from remote sensing, particularly because they don't take into account um, the ground fluxes. So that's another reason why uh, this is important to use different other approach, more ground-based approach. And uh, lastly, the role of tropical forest on carbon storage is uncertain. And this is notably because wet zones are poorly known. So they are poorly known in terms of their geographical extension. That's one thing. But they are also not very well known in terms of their functioning on the mineralization of organic matter. Um, mineralization, as you know, is the way you transform organic matter to turn it into CO2 that will go back into the atmosphere. And for example, um, Calabres and Porporato have shown the importance of the iron oxidation reduction cycling by ba bacteria on this exchange with the atmosphere. And Huang and Hall have said that in contrast to uh, what uh, we might think, this is not because you are in the reducing environment that you will keep for very long the CO2, the, the carbon that is stored uh, in the wet zones. In fact, after some time, the, uh, the oxidized iron will eventually be uh, reduced and as a result uh, it will be mere, the, the organic matter and therefore the CO2 will, uh, will be uh, evacuated. So there are still a lot of questions concerning the functioning um, of the, the, the carbon seek and the, 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 the iron cycle, hence the interest of studying the, these two connections. And indeed iron is a key element for the carbon cycling in, in soils and water in these two um, illustrations taken from a good review by Vu uh, and co-workers, 
you can see, I don't go in detail into all these slides, but you can see that both in soils and in surface water, I'm talking about uh, uh, rivers and lakes, you can see the connections between uh, the organic matter, and therefore carbon, and iron, because it form, it forms, they form complexes, the interaction at the root of, uh, of plants, but you also have uh, processes of oxidation, precipitation, reducing dissolution that are partly uh, physical chemical, but they are frequently induced by bacterial activity. Uh, and that's the same thing for, um, for the, the, the rivers and the lake. So there are strong connections between uh, these two cycles. Moreover, the iron cycling is interesting in itself because iron is the fourth most abundant element in the continental crust. And therefore, if you study ionized variations in nature, this means that by mass, you will study something absolutely significant. It is key in many biogeochemical -geo processes. We were mentioning uh, the interaction between soils, plants, water, bacteria. But it, it is also an important uh, carrier of other metals as a form of oxide in uh, natural waters. And it, it also has an important role in tropical landscape, for example, through the uh, lateritic crust that will form hills in, uh, in the tropical uh, uh, environments. But there are still many unknowns about its uh, cycle. For example, the role of the biosphere I was mentioning um, is just qualitative. We, we miss uh, really a full quantitative appreciation of the process. In terms of the mass balance in the Amazon basin, it is incomplete. Study past studies based on the concentration uh, found uh, missing uh, reservoirs and the distribution in space and time in the rivers remains unknown. So there is a need for another approach of the simple consideration of iron concentration and the use of the stable isotope of iron for sources and reaction could be the way to do it. So you remember Friday, Wednesday, uh, the, the notation we use for calcium isotope. This is the notation for iron. So it has four stable isotopes. We use again the delta notation, so again, if you have a 57 or a 54 ratio of your sample uh, relative to that of your reference material, you will say that you have a heavy iron isotope signature relative to your reference and the opposite, uh, it will be light. And as I was mentioning, these isotope signature allow to find more easily iron source than by the simple use of concentrations. And they may also allow you to uh, identify dominated chemical reaction involving iron in the favorable cases, such as, for example, if you have a redox reaction and that you have a, a, separ a good separation between uh, the reactants and the product. So this clearly provides a new dimension to study iron cycling. So if you want to study the Amazon basin, then you have to um, to, to go to the field and look at different type of, of environments. So these nice uh, pictures are mostly made for the European who do not know the Amazon basin. So I know you, you know very well this place. For example, this is yeah, the Negro River. So this is a black water, rich in organic matter, very acidic uh, water with a pH at around four, uh, rather low electric uh, conductivity. And in this uh, field trip that was conducted in uh, December 2010, it was uh, at, uh, in the low water season. It was a very dry period, as I was mentioning earlier. On. And we also went um, during the high water season. This time, this is the Solimois uh, River. Uh, so um, with a higher electric conductivity, much more suspended matter. The pH is higher as well, uh, to around 6. And as you can see, uh, many trees were underwater because this was in May 2009, which was a sentinel uh, uh, flooding. So we were lucky, we really went uh, into extreme conditions to do this field work. In terms of the method, uh, we use uh, this kind of boats to do uh, the field trips with the surface sampling uh, on smaller boats to avoid contamination from, uh, from the boat. And for deep sampling, we use this kind of tools uh, that have been devised by oceanographers in the beginning. <clears throat> After that, we do things, uh, many uh, water treatment uh, on board. These are slides, I think, uh, come from uh, Daniel Mulholland. So we do physical, chemical uh, parameter measurement, pH, conductivity, temperature. 
We do frontal filtration on boards, trying to be uh, as clean as possible, which is not always easy. And uh, on some occasion, we even did a tangential ultra filtration to have these two, uh, two um, uh, filtration uh, uh, pores. And this was uh, a work that was done by uh, Thierry Allard from IPMC on a, on a cruise that we did uh, together. So on board during this trip, uh, Daniel Mulholland even did um, uh, studied the iron speciation, looking at the red oxide of iron, which is, as I mentioned, a, a key parameter to fractionate iron isotopes. And then back to the lab, uh, we digest the sample, even the waters, because they contain suspended matter, so you have to mineral mineralize them. Then we purify the iron uh, through anionic exchange chromatography, and after that we do the measurement by MCI-CPMS um, using a method that uh, we've produced some time ago. So you see this is the MCI-CPMS number one of Brasilia, but number two looks uh, really the same, and uh, last week uh, we, we set up the method uh, for iron and for silicon and, uh, and these machines. Uh, just to give you a hint of the long-term reproducibility we expect when things are working well, we've got a, a 0 0.07 per million two standard deviation on delta 57 iron. So if we have that, we are happy. And we can see many things. Just maybe uh, a general context before I go back to, 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 the, to the Amazon basin. One of the questions we had in the beginning uh, was sparkled by uh, work uh, done in the ocean with our colleagues from the Legos lab in the uh, Oceanography lab in Toulouse, uh, notably with Francois Lacan. And they did a cruise, did depth sampling, so you can see one here and one here, and the isotopic results are there, and you can see that far from the South African coast, you've got this isotopic profile, whereas closer to the South African coast, you have this uh, Depth, depth profile. And this profile could be easily interpreted in terms of uh, organic matter mineralization, the, the phytoplankton likes uh, light iron isotopes. But here it was less clear why we should have less phytoplankton here. And the thing is that we've got this uh, aguilas current that could bring some uh, continental derived um, iron and the continental crust isotopic composition is this gray line here but it is not clear whether this was due to uh, through erosion of the coast or if this was really brought by the rivers so we needed to know what was the isotopic composition brought by rivers and at that time uh, it was uh, about 10 years ago even though we published this uh, later there was a debate some people said it is light others say no it is heavy well we had various sorts of uh, of debate so this is why we went to the Amazon, the biggest river, to have a, at least a, an isotopic signature that was significant. Mm -hmm. And the red mm -hmm. dots are all various uh, sampling zones that uh, we, we took to, during the cruises I was mentioning. And without any further uh, waiting any further, here are the results globally. So I'm talking about bulk water data. And you can see that for most of the samples, we've got values that are close to 0 0.1 per mil, which is, as you can see, very close to the value of the continental cross. So we got our answer, at least the, the water carried by the Amazon water uh, and going into the Atlantic Ocean is very close to the continental cross. But you can see that uh, we've got differences. In fact, most of those waters showing this continental crust are top signature are from white waters, whereas those showing a lighter uh, iron isotope signature come from black waters. So it seems that uh, we can say something about the sources of this iron. And indeed, there's no need to do um, complicated iron isotope measurement. You just need to look at a satellite image and say that these black waters um, uh, leaching the evergreen rainforest, which, are, which mostly contain podzol, have a light ironized top composition, whereas these white waters, here you've got the solimoids, here you've got the Madeira, um, mostly carry detrital sediment coming from the erosion of the Andes, and therefore they have the continental crust ironized top composition. One thing that you may wonder if you are on your small boat on such a huge river is how representative is your bottle that you take uh, of sample? Because 
This may seem as a silly question, but this is a question that uh, we have to, to, to address during this kind of uh, investigations. And indeed, if you were interested by only uh, iron concentration, then uh, you could tell that your the concentrate the, that your bottle doesn't uh, uh, isn't really representative of the full section of the river because I don't show you the results of the lateral profile, but here are depth profile coming from part of the PhD of Regina dos Santos Pinheiro. And you can see that as you go depth, then the concentration of iron vary. But if you look at the isotopic composition, whatever the type of water, but for the white water with depth, you have the same signature. And for the black waters with depth, you also have the same signatures. So it means that the water sample will be much more representative for iron isotope than concentration, um, at least for suspended metal, because here I'm showing you the result of suspended matter. Another thing that we have to take into account, of course, when we study those rivers, are the uh, specific uh, process that occur during the mixing of water having contrasted uh, chemical properties. And this is, of course, the, uh, the, the, the mixing zone between the Negro River and the Solomons River, which you probably have seen uh, already. And the thing is that we found during this uh, trip that the mixing is not complete even after 100 and 60 kilometers downstream. And in fact, we saw this with, uh, for example, electrical conductivity. We saw this on the basis of the chemical and isotopic uh, measurements. But you can even tell this on the basis of the uh, satellite image. You can see on the left, you still have the, the negro black waters, and on the right, the solimoist white waters. And I was mentioning about uh, the mass balance issue uh, of iron. And if you look at uh, the flow rate of the different river, consider the concentration and make your mass balance calculation, then you realize that between what comes from the Negro, Solimois, and Madeira and what uh, uh, arrives in the, in the Amazon, then you lose between 25 to 50 percent of the iron, which is really a lot. It means that you lose by up to 19,000 tons of iron per day in the river. So Jean-Michel Martinez used to joke about this and say that I found a mine of iron uh, under the Amazon, <laughs> but that's a lot, of, a lot of iron that is missing. You can have a beginning of an answer if you look at those kind of acoustic Doppler current profile um, across the um, Amazon River in the mixing zone. So you should imagine that the, the flow is going towards you. On the left, uh, you've got the Negro. On the right, you've got the Solimois. And you can see that the particles are going much faster in the Solimans than in the Negro, yet we have only a marginal uh, mixing here, but in fact, those two uh, streams follow in parallel for, for quite a long time. And you can see that in some places, you've got this kind of ridges, which could be the locus of the precipitation of iron and as well as the other sediments. Another way to tackle this issue is to look at this time, not the bulk water data, but to look at the ironized up composition of the different fraction of the waters. And that's a, a work uh, we did uh, with Daniel. And you can see that depending on the water, you've got quite different isotopic signatures. In the Negro River, you see the coarsest the fraction, the lighter is the isotopic composition, whereas in the colloidal fraction and the most dissolved fraction are very heavy by more than one per meal. But for the Solimoist River, this is not at all the, the same story. The particulate fraction is very close to the continental crust. And uh, when you go to the colloidal and fully dissolved fraction, then you go towards line family. And when you mix, um, when you mix these two waters, then you have a really a curious result. The suspended material is uh, close to the value of the continental crust, whereas You've got intermediate uh, situation in here, and the most uh, dissolved fraction remains isotopically heavy. So clearly, the mixing of iron is not conservative at all. But if you reconstruct the isotopic composition of all those fractions, then you, you still have the, the, the bulk iron isotope composition of the water that we found in the beginning, that is the continental press value. So really, the filtrations work are very interesting to unravel the mechanism occurring during the mixing of these waters. If we want to go further and now understand what are the mechanisms under this, 
we need to do spectroscopic studies such as electron paramagnetic resonance work of the colloidal fraction, something we did with Daniel and, uh, and Thierry Allard from NPMC. And you can see that if you compare uh, the end member of the Negro River, F equals zero, and the end member of the Solimois River, F equals one, and those uh, mixing fraction were based on element that mix conservatively, that is uh, oxygen and hydrogen isotope. You, are, you remember Roberto because we did that uh, together. And uh, then you can see that when you go from the Negro River to the Solimoys, we've got a decrease of this uh, of this molecule, iron three plus comple comple complex with organic matter. And on the other hand, you've got an increase of iron or oxyhydroxide in the mixing zone. So you really see the evolution of the speciation as the mixing occurs. And when you look, for example, at the iron 3 plus complex with organic matter, then you can see that uh, it correlates uh, very nicely with the iron isotope signature of the colloidal fraction. So we have, with the iron isotope signature, a direct proxy of this molecule. <clears throat> so clearly, contrasted iron isotope in different fraction track processes involving iron during contrasted water mixing. And we've got a new approach to study those, those processes. Then the last uh, type of investigation we could do are time series. And this is something we did in the framework of the PhD of uh, Gianna Dos Santos uh, Pinero. And uh, she compared the iron isotope composition of uh, white waters, which is uh, Amazon River at Obidos, and you can see that, that compared to the continental crust, 0 0.1 per mil, whatever the, the date and therefore the season, you always have the same isotopic composition. There are no significant variations. But if you look at black waters, then the suspended matter is very light and it varies depending on the, on the month. So that's clearly a different behavior. And another interesting information here is that our, we've reported results obtained by Ingri and co-workers on the Calix River, which is a boreal river. Uh, this is also a black water. You can see that you also have seasonal variations, but they are different from the Negro River, both in absolute terms, the values are much heavier, as well as in terms of uh, the uh, variation depending on the month. And this clearly shows the effect of the climate condition under which those waters uh, interacted with the soils and the, uh, and the river's margin. So clearly there is a, an interesting uh, climatic signal here. After that, we try to see to what these uh, iron isotope signature correlate. We, we tried various things and we found that the best correlation were found with the, um, the precipitations and with the Negro River discharge rate. The thing is that, for example, whereas while we have this decrease, you could see things were going more or less together. The issue we had is that you can see that there is a two to four month lag between the iron isotope signatures and the precipitation, for example, and two month lag between the iron isotope signatures and um, the um, water discharge rate. So you would think, okay, maybe there is a kind of transfer function in which the water stays for very long into the soils before it goes back into the into the river. That's a possible in interpretation. But maybe this is also because we had issues. And this is something we, we could envision. Uh, when uh, Jenna looked at uh, the precipitation chronicles uh, 10 years ago, she could only get them through by contacting directly the people at Inmet. And uh, she could only access the Barcelos uh, station, which is 200 kilometers downstream from uh, Serenia, which is the place where the samples are taken regularly by people from the Hibam Observatory on which we did this work. And therefore, it might not be that representative. And if you want to be uh, convinced, so that's the monthly precipitation chronicle from Barcelos. And more recently, I have been uh, to the Inmet website because now the data are online. And I could access to the data from Barcelos, but also from French Bois, Europe's, and Lorette's. 
And then if you look at the precipitation chronicle of all those zones, then you can see that uh, this is extremely heterogeneous and that's no surprise for somebody who has been in the Amazon basin already. Uh, the rain event can be very strong, but they are frequently very localized. And even uh, if you take monthly uh, averages, for example, if you look at August 2007, it was 150 uh, millimeters of water on average. But if you if you take the value of Barcelos, but if you go to Loaet, then it was three times that value. So really, there are huge difference, and it's probably more uh, appropriate for the, this kind of work to to look at uh, average of all those stations, which is represented by the blue thick line here. And we are going to see what uh, what uh, is the result of that. I mentioned before that. Um, iron concentrations and iron isotope may not give you the same type of information and this is something you can see for example if you look at the concentrated matter iron concentration at Serenia so on the same filters you can see that you essentially have a scatter with no relationship at all with the with the climate or with the seasons the only uh, correlation we could find uh, was uh, that we could see an anti-correlation between these iron concentration and the concentration of the suspended matter, but nothing more. So clearly we have two different messages here. Another issue we wanted to, uh, to tackle is whether those uh, data are really reproducible. Yes, I think. And so we compare those data with data that we've obtained during field campaigns. So this is, these are not the same site. These are located in Parikatuba, north of Manaus, eastward of uh, eastward, uh, westward of Manaus, upstream. Uh, yet, this, plus this is not the same year. Here it was October 2006, but you can see that in 2009 and 2010, for depth profile and uh, lateral profile on the suspended matter, we've got a good agreement between the three values. So that's uh, reassuring. And this is a, a value obtained by a peering work by Berkowitz and Ball in 2006, again near Parikatuba. And again, they got about uh, the same value for the same time as the one we've obtained for 2007. So it seems, at least uh, from uh, specific and, uh, uh, sampling, we've got a good agreement with our time series. But of course, you want to see whether, for example, this trend would reproduce in different years. So this is uh, something we, we've investigated uh, further more recently by asking more uh, features to the, the IBAM uh, observatory. So I'm putting here the, the first series. You can uh, maybe see that there is a jump in April, this was a value that was discounted. <coughs> no comment. <laughs> and then this is the second series. And uh, it was a lot of work, but you can see that the results are terrible because uh, the data are not reproducible at all. Uh, if you compare the same month, you can see that if you take into account the uncertainties, those values are, are not the same. So when you see this kind of results, and this is even worse for 2005, the other year that was available. So when you have this uh, result, these are data we've obtained uh, maybe two or three years ago. You just put your data in the drawer, thinking that this will mature, talking with colleagues for help. <laughs> and one day I showed this to Jean-Michel Martinez and he told me, but you know that the second series of filters we sent you were collected on the 10th of each uh, month, whereas on the first series you worked on the first of each month, and they are not filtered at the same uh, uh, granulometry, not at the same pore size. And then if you come back to this result obtained with Daniel, and you compare with the 0 0.0, 0 0.22 microns with the data obtained with the 0 0.045 micron filtration, then you see that you do not have the same value for the same water. So in fact, there is a systematic bias. And if you apply this correction to the time series, here it goes. No, you've got a good agreement, at least for 2006 and 2007, between uh, the two series. So that's nice. So we can say that this is the same uh, series and that they are reproducible. So we were happy. But, and even the 
the April data were reproducing well, which is nice. But you can see that the 2005 data do not reproduce well at all. So we still have an issue there. So let's see what those 2007 data correlate with. You remember that this time, and so this is the same daily discharge data that I'm reproducing, uh, that I'm showing here. And you can see that on average, they follow quite well the, the trend uh, of the ironized stop signature of the suspended matter. There is just a misfit here, but you can easily interpret this event here as a kind of flushing effect through which you lose all the iron that would be isotopically heavy and then upon further flushing then you would again uh, drain the iron that would be isotopically light. Of course this is something that needs to be investigated and proven by field study and this is something we would like to do but at least there is a reasonable way to explain this. But uh, if you look at the 2005 data there are no correlations at all. Now that we can we take the Western average for monthly precipitation, then you see that they fit very nicely with the daily discharge rate and therefore with the 2006-2007 data. So we've got a good agreement. So it was really important to have a regional average uh, for the precipitation in the high Nego River. But we still have this problem with the two, year 2005. So to solve this issue, maybe we could look at another parameter, which is the suspended uh, the concentration of the suspended matter, something we didn't look at much because it is very scattered, as you can see here. So it was hard to find any correlation. But if you look at the 2005 data, they are very scattered as well. But on average, they seem heavier, than, higher than the um, 2007 data. And if you remember about the white water's behavior, you remember that they had an isotopic composition that was closer to the continental crust. I can show you this graph again. That's a white water with less variations and a value that is close to that of the continental crust, whereas the black water are much lighter and very much more. So it may well be that here what we see, if you compare the mean of the amount of suspended matter between 2007 and 2005, uh, conditions under which uh, we had a much drier period and you remember that 2005 was the driest year in 100 years so maybe the iron isotope are telling us something about this extremely dry year here so really it is a very sensitive marker to a number of parameters so to summarize the evolution of suspended matter iron isotope signature from black waters we could see that it shows seasonal variation reflecting change of interaction between water, so linked to rain discharge rate, and probably soil headwater sources. And I'm referring to the Conrad et al. Uh, study in the Calix River, a boreal river, uh, that would affect the iron cycling. But we need to go to the field to, to do the same type of work that they've done. And we've seen that it is very sensitive to water, watershed uh, climatic conditions, it's sensitive to the season. Uh, to the boreal versus tropical conditions and it, it, is, it seems also very sensitive to the very dry year. But again, we need to confirm that by more work. So, uh, that's what I, I was just saying. We need to study more precisely the interaction between the hydrological, the iron and the organic matter cycling in headwater streams to understand the mechanism involved and their impact on the carbon cycling. So here, are the, the suggestion I'm making now and uh, I hope you will uh, give me advice and more suggestions on this basis. Looking at the literature, I found a very interesting study by our colleagues from INPA in their biological reserve, which are named Cuieras and Campina, about 60, 60 kilometers north of Manaus. So these are uh, instrumented uh, small watersheds. Uh, they are pi piezometers, they are atmospheric towers, and they studied the um, this Azul stream, which starts here, if you look at the catena from a lateritic soil to, um, um, to a, a pozzo, they also have the Campina site, which is very close to the BRE 174 road, which is uh, a kind of a pod giant pozzo, well, very similar to the giant pozzo of northwest uh, of the Amazon basin. So they are very interesting sites. And the, uh, that would, 
the, they did a time series experiment in which they tried to find the correlation between the electrical conductivity, the discharge rate, the organic carbon of carbon, the dissolved organic carbon, and the pH. And they found that depending on the, the rain events, so we are just talking about a few a few a few days of monitoring, they could they could find nice correlation between the discharge rate and the electrical conductivity and the uh, organic the dissolved organic carbon for some events. And on the strongest events, then the discharge rate is more related to the pH rather than the um, electrical conductivity and the dissolved organic carbon. So really, depending on the type of event you have, you have a different reaction between the waters and the soils. And I think that would be very interesting to work in this site and see how the iron is reacting as well as seeing how the carbon isotopes and the, to study the molecular structure of the organic matter in these kinds of streams. I guess this would be... a an excellent example, and this is the place where we will go next week to, to see uh, whether it is possible to, to begin a collaboration uh, with them. And once we have understood everything about the water, carbon, and iron cycle in the Amazon basin, then we can see what is the impact of uh, humankind. So this is something we started to do in the preliminary, pre, in preliminary study in, within the framework of uh, Alison Ackerman's PhD work in which we compare um, small watersheds, uh, either located in well-preserved uh, forests, to uh, zones that are more or less, uh, well, rather more than less, but that have been deforested at various times. So here we've got an area that has been smashed and burned a few weeks before. Here, this is the same site a few months after. Here, this is a pasture that was established about 12 years ago. And here, this is a pasture that was uh, established about 50 years ago. These sites, uh, these sites come from Para, whereas these sites come from uh, the Amazonas. And uh, we've published recently with Alison, Priscilla, and, uh, and others the, the, the results we've obtained on the soils already. And we can see that uh, as you go from the top of the hill to downhill to the river, whereas on the top of the hill you have a typical ironized composition of the continental crust, that is 0.1 per mil. As you go down, because of redox processes occurring uh, near the river with the formation of Pozzo, then you tend to, to go towards a heavy iron isotope signature. But if you go through deforestation, then you lose those very heavy iron isotope signatures, and you have a kind of rejuve rejuvenation of the, of the iron isotope signature, essentially through a process of erosion. And on the basis of these works, we are able to predict what would be the, the ironized top signature of the suspended matter and of the dissolved matter. Um, and whereas we, we, it is measured that the uh, ironized top signature of the um, suspended matter is isotopically light, whereas the dissolved matter is isotopically heavy, we saw that in the Rio Negro, then we should have the opposite upon uh, deforestation. So let's see what it gives. So this is the example of the 50 years old pasture. So in the in the forest, we indeed have a heavy uh, dissolved, this time we're talking about the dissolved iron isotope signature, whereas in the pasture, you've got a lighter uh, isotopic uh, signature. So this is consistent with our understanding of the, the processes at play. But if you look at the area that has been uh, slashed and burned a few months before, then you can see again that in the forest, you have this value that is close or a bit heavier than the continental crust uh, iron isotope signature. But for the streamed uh, in the slash and burn area, you've got a very large variations. You've got a huge variation about, this is about the whole range you can find in iron isotope signature on the earth, showing you that the, 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 the site has been totally perturbed, which is not a bit surprised because when you do slash and burn, you burn the, the forest, you destroy uh, all, the, all the bacteria, you change the mineralogy of the soils, you change the draining of the water, and therefore the iron isotope also reflect this. So again, these are very sensitive and good markers of this effect that we hope we could, we could find downstream in the rivers. So that's the end, I will conclude. So you've seen that uh, stable iron isotope composition are very sensitive to the iron cycling in the environment. 
They can tell us on the source and order mechanism at play, depending on what you are looking at. They allow us to study the organic matter cycling under an original and thus promising uh, perspective, I think, which we need to focus more on this in the future. To understand better the natural environment functioning, we nevertheless need to conduct works combining hydrology, pedology, mineralogy, geochemistry, biology, through time series, because you could see the variation we have uh, throughout the, uh, the seasons. And uh, I think this should provide a new light on the issues at stake on the response of the Amazonian forest climate change and on deforestation, as shown by the preliminary example I've uh, just illustrated here. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Do, if you have the suggestion or comments, part of that. Well, actually, I do have a question. Um, I do have a question. So, <laughs> okay, this is all new to for me. So, I just, I just, one of the things that caught my attention was the fact that both deforestation and dryness. Give you a light signal, light as a good signal. Is that so? In the forest. In, in, in the forest. So yeah. I was looking at your graph. You were showing that in 2005, your isotopes were lighter than in 2007, and that's when you had a big drought. Is that so? Yes. Uh, I, I mentioned it, but I should have said it uh, more clearly. Here we're talking about the dissolution, the dissolved part. The dissolved fraction of iron, whereas for the time series, I was looking at the suspended fraction. And if you remember what we saw, for example, in the Negro River, they are opposite. Um, the suspended matter in those uh, organic matter enriched water are isotopically light, whereas the dissolved fraction is isotopically heavy. But whatever, you're right, whatever the thing you, you look at, whether this is the dissolved fraction or whether this is the particulate matter, upon deforestation, you will have an inversion of the uh, isotopic fractionation, so a stronger signal. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at the uh, graph that you showed, to track the transformation of the forest from a tropical forest to a savanna, like you were <clears throat> in the beginning, I didn't know <laughs> that that was the the projection for the Amazon forest. But by the end of the century, we would have a savanna there. Possibly, the most extreme uh, hypothesis uh, formulate this. Not everybody agree on that. There is still a lot, of, a lot of debate. So this is why we need to work on that. But yes, for some of them, yes, by two thousand one hundred, we might have a, a savanna instead of a rainforest. So this is really an important uh, change. Mm -hmm. A savanna like this, I have. Yes. Well, I don't know if it will be. Maybe like uh, no, or no, or not test. <laughs> yes. So no, this will be a big change. Uh, the question um, I can give you two answers. Uh, if it is a fast event, maybe we will have something like this. That is um, a trend by which you will go from. So I'm talking about the dissolved. Um, uh, you will go from heavy iron isotope composition to light uh, dissolved iron isotope composition. But if you think about it, you will have more more erosion and less um, zones which will be enriched into uh, redox uh, reduced zones such as uh, um, uh, marécage uh, wet zones. And therefore, you may tend to go to a signature that will go from the Negro River signature to the Solimoist River, in which you will more have an erosional type of, uh, of event. And therefore, you will uh, tend towards this isotopic signature. So we could indeed uh, think that we will have these two trends. Okay. Thank you. My 
question is, uh, most of the data you have comes, comes from the people, right? This is true for maybe 90% of the presentation. The last result of where it came on small streams. Yeah. And the reason I'm asking is because we did some experiments in Amazon for certain common attributes. And we know that there is a big difference when you consider the big river influence and the same go up on the, the local influence. So I, I, I think that looking at, to understand these processes, with the big rivers, you have so many inputs in different sites. It's going to be very difficult to, very difficult to, to really understand what's going on and pinpoint this effect comes from that region and so on. So I, I, I think that to understand better what's going on with carbon, the really loss of iron, you need to go to very, say, small scale events. It's a black. In the people, people side. This, this yes. Is very yes, it's true. And, and when the pH goes up down, when you measure the pH when when it goes goes down, <coughs> right, goes down, right? Yeah. That's because there's more CO2 in the system. And, 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 and I wonder yeah. if the, when you have more pH coming down, if how how is the rain how is the rain event in this situation? So yeah. that's very important to know. The in this specific place, uh, the <coughs> so there are two questions there. Um, the Montero et al. paper has also the precipitation chronicles, so we can find out. But just to come back with your first question, initially I wanted just to jump onto the small stream and do everything that was possible to do to study those processes. But you are right in the sense that what we see in big rivers might not be found directly into small stream and headwaters because there is probably a transfer function which to start with will simply begin because you will have a different type of uh, rivers that will meet for example uh, here if you want to study the negro river uh, near Paricatuba, you've got the, the branco river that will meet which is a white water so you have to take these things into account plus you may have exchange with the riparian zones that may also play a role so, in fact, I think it would be more reasonable to start with uh, to do chronicle work on three different sites here, for example. So, starting uh, doing one here, doing a time series maybe of six months, twice a month, here in the Azure Stream, then on the Cuiaras River, which is a bigger, a bigger river, and then a third one in the Paricatuba, which is the full Negro River. So, then you can study the transfer function between the, the small stream all the way through the big river. And then if you see that the signal is preserved all the way through the small stream, then you can really focus on what's going on there and uh, study the soils uh, through interdisciplinary research. To answer your, your, your second question about how the pH evolves uh, according to precipitation, when we have a strong rain event that is therefore associated with the uh, strong increase of discharge. What you see is not a decrease of the pH, but an increase of the pH. And their interpretation is that you probably leach more of the surface water and you have more kind of sediment leaching, uh, which indeed will really uh, lift uh, the, the pH of the waters in contrast to what you normally have when you go through the organic matter with all those uh, carbon cycling that will take this, the pH down. Why do I think that um, <coughs> discharge is not the best kind of Because this discharge can be an effect far away from the site. Mm -hmm. if, if, if the discharge, it means discharge means the water river, the river water goes up. It can be an effect of rain, let's say. 10, 20, 100 million. You remember the example I've shown with, by yeah. taking into account all the meteorological station in yeah. the High Nego River Basin. That's why so I you're absolutely right. The other thing, discharge, maybe is if they can have a precipitation, a rain station in the site, I think it would be the best way you know, to make a correlation between water and accumulation. And another thing is, I, I don't think my suggestion is. Um, if you're going to sample in this 
Oh, yes, we forgot about this. Sorry. <laughs> oh, so, so we are complaining. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna finish my questions. Uh, my point is, uh, it's like discharge. Discharge means how the water level, the variation of the water level, the river water level. That can be an effect that comes from 50, 100, even 200 kilometers away from the site. So you may have rain somewhere else, and then you have an increased rain in, uh, in, in river water in the site, but without no input or interaction with the soil. So my, my suggestion is to have a, uh, a rain station in the site so that you can understand the transfer of water, uh, rainwater, uh, soil, and then floods to, to, to the environment. I think that's very important. And as second point too is um, besides iron, I think it'd be very interesting to also to collect water and analyze, let's say, dissolved inorganic carbon, which is dick, um, dissolved organic carbon, as well as nitrogen <coughs> and uh, sulfate. Because then you can make a very good link between the water and, let's say, the soil in, in the sense of, of of the way the rainwater transferred these components to, to the to, to the you know in a horizontal direction, whatever. But I have a, my last question is: you mentioned about iron three plus in the organic matter, and 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 iron in organic matter makes a very strong effect on the iron isotopes. Does organic matter also have iron two plus? And how does this oxidation of iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus in this kind of environment would also change um, the uh, desktop fractionation or the iron ratio in these systems? Thank you, Roberto. So for the last question, I think uh, there are various possible answers. And uh, to, to, to give the right answer, we just need to go to the field and, uh, and check it. I fully agree that comparing sulfur, nitrogen, uh, as well as carbon isotope would be uh, very interesting. And to come back with your first question about uh, having a meteorological station there, they have one, and in the Monterey Tal paper, they show the meteorological chronicle. And one interesting feature is that even though this is a very small watershed, the Azu stream, they found that there is a transfer function between the precipitation, which are, look like Dirac's at the scale of, of one year, compared to the variation of the, uh, the flow rate of the river. So we already have indeed a kind of transfer function simply on such a small watershed. So we really need to take into account the precipitation uh, in the site and not only uh, the discharge rate, as you say, really you. You had a question? All right. I do have a question. From the audience, from the remote audience. From this we do have a question from Gislaine for me to be live. It's saying, thank hey, you, Frank, for the nice presentation. I would like to ask if you expect similar patterns of iron considering Brazilian waters along the coast. And she said, Brazilian basins along the coast have an effect of salinity, marine fields, for example. So you're talking about um, you're talking about uh, oceanic currents and whether they can affect the iron isotope signatures. Is is this a question? Yeah, I think she's 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 asking if you if you would expect um, a similar pattern of iron iron mm -hmm. isotopes. I think considering like in in the coast of Brazil, where we have marine in, in, intrusions. So she's 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 also I think she's she's asking if if these isotopes will change with salinity. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't have the answer on top of my head. But there have been many studies now published by either uh, Francois Lacan and his group, um, the people Sid John from the U.S., uh, Olivier Rouxel, 
I'm not sure that there is a direct link, but this is something uh, I could check and, and tell you later. But for sure, there is a, a link with uh, phytoplankton activity, that's for sure. We could see a link with um, currents uh, eroding uh, the, uh, the, the continental crust uh, along the shore. And uh, there, were, there are also exchanges between the, the particulate and the dissolution in the, the water column. Plus, there are also inputs from uh, mid-ocean ridges. So in the ocean, you've got various possible sources of iron that may have different iron as the composition. Not mentioning the particulate matter coming from the atmosphere, for example, the Sahara Rodas. Mm -hmm. All right. Jeslaini, let us know if your question has been answered. She is from Unifesp, Universidade Federal de São Paulo, Instituto do Mar. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have more questions? More questions? We have an audience here. I think Roberto, so, you know, yeah. <laughs> Okay, Frank, thank you very much. Thank you all for attending, despite uh, the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for our audience online. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm going to finish the streaming. So. Well, thank you very much, Fabiana, for once again organizing this. It was uh, very smooth and it worked very well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks Robert, for, for, for the funding. Tchau, gente. Obrigada. Obrigado.